Welcome to another a day of fasting here at Sunnah Followers. And by the way, this is the second week. Uh, we're almost, almost done with the second week of fasting. And you get to see just how fast time goes. You know, we're almost at the end of the second week of fasting, and we will soon be going into the third week, the third week being the not the last 10 days of Ramadan. So just for those of you who are not keeping track, we're almost over. Ramadan is halfway over. You know, Alhamdulillah, it seemed like we just started fasting yesterday, and here we are getting ready to go into the last 10 days in a minute. So, uh, mashallah, everyone should feel uh, proud of themselves for having made it this far. And again, for those of you who've had to break your fast along the way due to the chronic illness, and I, again, define what a chronic illness is. A chronic illness is a sickness of which there is no cure. And it may prevent you from fasting. For example, diabetes, there is no cure for diabetes. GERD, there is no cure for GERD. Lupus, there is no cure for lupus. So for those people with chronic illnesses such like such as those who have tried to fast, and you know, some days you do you make it, some days you don't, don't feel bad. Uh, the days that you had to break the fast due to your sickness uh becoming aggravated or whatnot just pay the ransom and again the ransom is food that is given to a needy muslim family uh uh you can give it say for example uh you know a muslim family in your community who's having a hard time uh, even uh, buying food to eat they have nothing to eat you can uh, uh take the equivalent of a day's meal for yourself and go and buy the food for them to have dinner uh, for that night or whatnot. So that's what you can do, those of us who are suffering with chronic illnesses. For those of you who've had to break your fast because you were sick, maybe you were pregnant. You had a regular pregnancy and you became so sick, you know, or whatnot uh, with your pregnancy and you had to break your fast with the pregnancy okay the women who are pregnant they fall in the category of the ransom too so say for example this is just a regular pregnancy i'm not a high risk but i was trying to fast but i got the sickness was so bad i had to throw up and and i was had to take medicine for my morning sickness or whatnot you pay the ransom for those days that you are unable to fast too you have to fast pregnant women have to fast but the days that they break have to break because of the morning sickness they will pay the ransom for now the high risk pregnancy women the high risk pregnancy women the high risk pregnancy women these are the women that don't have to fast but they too have to pay the ransom everybody got that so for you pregnant women the days that you became too sick and you had to break your fast cause of the sickness the morning sickness or whatnot they even give medicine for it now you know that you make those days up by paying the ransom okay okay so i hope we're all clear on that and don't feel bad as long as you're spending the rest of your fasting time remembering the law coming to my classes here at this website and i have a lot of classes we have classes going on all day long that's remembering a law you still get the reward of fasting okay and with that said let's go to the the lecture for today we've been speaking about how being that this is the second week of fasting what we want to work on as muslims during this week is developing our relationship with allah we want to work on becoming more god conscious more god conscious more conscious of allah that means before we take an action in our lives we think about what will Allah say? What will Allah say about me doing this? 
You know, does this action that I am about to en engage upon, does it bring about consequences that are bad from a law? That's a God conscious person. OK, so we want to look at our actions this week, take a good, hard look at our actions this week and ask ourselves, are the actions, the behavior, the choices that we're making in our lives this week, are they pleasing to a law? Are these actions that a law would like for us to take or adapt, or are they actions that he would not like? That's how you become more God conscious, more mindful of a law. And that in turn will, uh, will help to um, cause your fear of a law. Your fear of a law's punishment to increase. Because the more fearful we are of the consequences that Allah may give upon us, the more righteous we will become. So that's what we're focusing in on this week. And yesterday we spoke about uh, uh, some of the, the things that can result in your everyday life if you are more conscious of Allah. And just to update us, what are some of the things that being conscious of Allah can bring to you in your personal life? Anyone, take the microphone, because I don't read chats anymore. We're, uh, we're in the year 2021, not 1980 or 1990. That typing, y'all should be done with it. Get on the microphone and tell me uh, what type of benefits or rewards uh, does being conscious of a law bring? Anyone? Um, being conscious of a law um, allows what. Well, let me reword it all over again. Um, when you become conscious of a law, a law will grant you al Khan, which is the ability to recognize the truth from falsehood, right from wrong. This is a gift that a law gives to those individuals who are God conscious and have fear of his punishment. Um, these people have certainty of faith. So if you give them a hadith or a verse of the Quran, you can't, it's hard for them to misunderstanding because they have the correct understanding. So say for example that I'm gonna give one example of a hadith. The main one that people misconstrue would be the one about um women on this earth who like wear see-through clothing and how a lot of people believe that when Allah says their head takes the form of a camel, they think they're act it means that you can't wear a bun, but what it actually means is you know, in the hereafter, those women will be punished for the way that they dress and their um, head will take the form of a camel because in the hereafter, their size, you know, increases to, in they're bigger in size and that's a way of Allah punishing them for um, the bad choice that they made in this world. Exactly. That's one of the greatest gifts, guys, of being more God conscious. You won't be one of those uh, Muslims running around asking, oh, how do I know if this person is teaching me correctly? How do I know if this is a good person to follow on Facebook? How do I know if this man is teaching me the truth or not? Allah will give you the ability to recognize truth from falsehood. You will know that if the person is not basing whatever they're saying on what Allah said, what the prophet said, with the understanding of those companions, you will say, oh, this person's a fraud, and you'll be able to walk away. You wouldn't have to come here asking me, Sister Layla, I was listening to a brother speak on Facebook. You know, is what he's saying true? You should, you would know. Yeah. Or Sister Layla, there's a book that this sister wrote. Uh, do you think this is something that I should buy? You know. El Khan. This is a gift that only comes from Allah and he only gives it to a select few. Not everyone has this gift or this ability. Okay, what else? What's another uh, reward of being more conscious of Allah? Does anyone, can anyone say? What's another gift? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa Um, Allah will protect you and he will give you relief from your difficulties exactly and this is another great benefit a lot of people live in fear on this earth they are too afraid to practice their religion the correct way 
You're afraid of what other people will say or think of you. Well, if you were a person who was more conscious, who lived your life being conscious of a law and fearing his punishment, he will also you will he will cause you to accept that only he is your protector and that no one can harm you or benefit you unless he allows it. So you will practice your religion the correct way, not caring, not thinking what anyone else has to say about you. And this is something that we all need to work upon because Muslims today are so weak. You don't pray, you don't fast, you don't wear hijab, you don't dress correctly, you don't behave correctly because you're so concerned with what other people will think, what other people will say. You're afraid that someone might harm you, not understanding that nothing can happen to you unless Allah wills it. So mashallah, any other uh, benefits that we talked about? Good job, Yasmin. Any other benefits? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Allah will make the way out for you from every difficulty you face. MashaAllah. And that is so wonderful. Life is meant to be a trial. We were created to worship Allah. We were put here on this earth to be tested over and over and over again in our belief in him. So Allah is going to subject us to so many trials, to so many difficulties. And ev the stronger your faith, guys, the test will not get easier. The stronger your faith, the more severe your tests will be. But Allah will give you the means to overcome any situation that you face. As long as you have taqwa law, that consciousness of him. Some people before, a lot of people might ask, is it not true that the greatest trial for us to deal with is death? The death of a loved one? Not necessarily. When a person dies, Allah has removed any pain or any trials that that person could have subjected you through on this earth away from you, okay? You never know what the future holds for a person. You could lose a son, but Allah works in mysterious ways. Perhaps Allah knew that that son was the apple of your eye and maybe that son would have grown up to put you through so much fitna that you would not have been able to bear it. So Allah did you a favor. You just don't see it as a favor yet. Okay. So death of a relative of a loved one. A lot of people think that that may be the greatest trial. No, the greatest trial is dealing with the fitna of a living relative. You have another son who's living, that son is subjecting you through trial after trial after trial. It's hard to deal with the trials of this son and walk away a survivor and a winner with the law, okay? So death may not necessarily, you know, be a hardship. A lot of people say, well, Sister Layla, what thing I lost a, a, my son. I couldn't, Allah couldn't subject me to anything worse than that. I'm here to tell you, oh yes, look at your life. The loss of your son was easy. Dealing with your living sons, your living sons, that's what's hard. Being able to walk away, to know when to hold and know when to fold, to know when to draw the line with your living sons. That's harder than dealing with the death of, another, of the other one, subhanAllah. So you guys see, you know, there's wisdom behind what Allah does and the stronger your faith, the greater your test. Your faith today is stronger than it was 10 years ago when Allah took the apple of your eye from out of your life. So since your faith, your belief in Allah is stronger, now Allah is subjecting you through trial after trial with your living sons. You see that? Because the stronger your faith, the greater the trial. 
So the at but El Furkan and also having consciousness of Allah, this helps you to get through that because as Allah says, He will provide a way for you from out of every difficulty that you face, be it the trials of your children, the trials of your husband, not having money, not having food, Allah will cause you uh, to be able to handle it, get out of it and make grow from it. And that's something that we have to accept. And now with that said, let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen for today's uh, lecture because we're going to continue to speak about the fruits or the trials of having taqwa Allah, the fruits, the trials, the rewards of being conscious of Allah. Let me put this uh, PowerPoint up on the screen. Let me find it. You know, I have to play with this uh, computer. And now let me change this screen share to full screen. It was supposed to be, right? Yeah, right here, I think. Okay, inshallah, everybody should be able to see my screen. So we're gonna speak more about the benefits of having consciousness of Allah, because this is what we wanna work on this week. Understand that a person who has consciousness and fear of Allah, this is a person who thinks about Allah in his or her everyday life. They fear Allah's anger. They don't wanna make Allah angry. So thus they live obeying him. They live obeying him and there's many rewards as a result. For example, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, and we have instructed those who were given the books before you and yourselves to have consciousness and fear of Allah. But if you disbelieve, then to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and on the earth. And ever is Allah free of having of need and having praise from you. So again, Allah is letting us know that not just us, he not only commanded us to be conscious of him and to fear his punishment, but this same command he gave to the Christians and the Jews who came before us. Did they pass their test? No, they didn't. That's why Allah re replaced them with us. So he's telling us the same thing. He told them, be conscious of him, fear his punishment, live your life on this world, enjoying the good things that Allah put here and made lawful for you. But be conscious of him and understand that there are consequences to the choices that we make in this world. Make sure that the choices we make in this world are choices that he would approve of. Listen to what the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, fear Allah and perform your five daily prayers. Also fast the month of Ramadan, pay your charity tax, obey your leaders. And by doing this, you will enter paradise. And this is something that we struggle with all the time as Muslims. Too many of us are too lazy to perform our prayers. Too many of us, we put all our focus on doing voluntary deeds, not understanding that the voluntary fast that you do mean nothing mean nothing if you're not doing the obligatory one. We spent all last month fasting all these voluntary prayers when you didn't have to. And now that Ramadan's here, you looking for an excuse to break your fast. You looking for a fatwa to even get out of fasting. So here are the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling us that if we live our lives being conscious of Allah, fulfilling our obligations to him and obeying the people in charge over us, this is how we enter paradise. And by the way, wearing a hijab is an obligation too. Growing the beard is an obligation too. Providing and maintaining your family, that's an obligation too. The obligations don't are not just those five pillars. Allah set the guidelines and rules for other things too, we have to fulfill all our obligations and obey our leaders. And that's how we will enter paradise. In fact, whenever the prophet 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would send an expedition out uh, uh, for military cognizance or whatnot, he would always advise them to have consciousness and fear of Allah, because that consciousness and fear of Allah would prevent them from transgressing Allah's laws by killing innocent people or destroying temples or things that they aren't supposed to do or any of that. And I told you yesterday how even Umar would advise his military commanders and even his son. He wrote a letter to a, a son of his. He said, I advise you to have fear of Allah because whoever fears Allah, Allah will protect him. Whoever gives a loan to Allah, Allah will reward him. And whoever gives thanks to Allah, Allah will increase him. This was a son of his that was leaving, uh, had left uh, Medina and went to go live in Syria. This is when uh, Islam had spread from out of um, uh, uh, Arabia during his caliphate uh, to Syria and Iraq. So one of his sons decided to go and live over in one of the new founded Islamic uh, provinces. And so Umar said, this is the, he, the, he said, this is the advice I'm going to give you wherever you go, wherever you decide to live, have fear of Allah, because if you fear Allah, Allah will be your protector. And this is something that we need to advise our children too, when our children decide to embark upon their own life. So again, consciousness and fear of Allah is only attained when we put between ourselves and that which we fear a guard to protect us. And how is this done? This is done by living our lives, obeying the law and staying away from the things he told us to stay away from. You women out there who don't wear hijab, I'm sorry, you don't have a guard th that will protect you, okay? Because you are deliberately intentionally disobeying him. You brothers who don't grow beards, you brothers who don't take, provide and maintain your families, you don't have that guard over you to protect you because you're not obeying a law. You're not doing what a law commanded you to do. So the only way to attain taqwa Allah or consciousness and fear of his punishment is by living your life, doing the things that Allah commands you to do and staying away from what he commanded us to stay away from. And again, for those of us who do this, the benefits are many. And we all complain about how difficult our trials in life are. Well, again, Allah tells us whoever keeps their fear of Allah, Allah will keep his duty to you and he will make your situation easy for you. Again, you want to be able to deal with the trials of life, have consciousness of Allah. Also, Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning as for he or she who gives in charity and keeps their duty to Allah and has fear of Allah's punishment and who believes in rewards from Allah, Allah will make easy for him the path of ease. So again, Allah will give you that ability to overcome what of whatever trials you are facing in life. What, uh, whatever hardships you are encountering, be it with your family, your job, yourself even. Also, being conscious of Allah and fearing his punishment will serve as a great protection from your personal jinn. Remember, each and every one of us has a personal jinn. That jinn never sleeps. That jinn knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He hoovers around in your heart looking for a means to attack you, to get you to transgress the limits of Allah. Well, Allah tells us in the interpretation, the meaning, those who have consciousness and fear of him, whenever an evil thought comes to you from shaitan, you will remember Allah and see what is right and not give in to it. How is it we all as human beings suffer with evil thoughts? Some of us give into those notions, others don't. 
I have many Muslims ask me all the time, Sister Layla, you know, you're an attractive woman. How is it that you've been single for over 15 years? Over 15 years. Don't you get have desires? Don't you want to be married? Well, whenever a thought like that enters my mind, it, this, it goes away. Allah gives me the ability to not give in to that. I've been single for 15 years and I'll be single until I die, inshallah, okay? Because I have no desire to ever get married again, you know? But whenever any uh, notions uh, come to me from my personal jinn to uh, disobey Allah and commit sin, I say, a'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim, and it goes away. Allah has given me the strength to overcome that. I don't even have those type of desires anymore. Allah will make it easy for you if you are conscious of him and if you fear his punishment. But for those of us who have no fear of Allah or no consciousness of him, you'll be one of those women on 90 Day Fiance. Okay. Also, being conscious of Allah and having fear of his punishment will cause a law to open the heavens and send blessings down upon you in this world. Listen to what a law says in the interpretation of the meaning. And if the people of the towns had believed and had consciousness and fear of a law, certainly we have we would have opened up blessings from from the heavens and the earth for them. A lot of people say, Sister Layla, why is it, you know, that nothing good ever happens to me? Ask yourself, take a look at yourself. Are you living your life being conscious of a law? Are you living your life fearing his punishment or are you doing sins and not caring? For those of us who are conscious of a law, for those of us who have fear of him, the blessings just keep on coming. You open up the, your door today and there's a gift. Open up your door tomorrow, there's another gift. The blessings just keep on coming from the heavens and the earth to those of us who believe in Allah, who remain conscious of him and fearful of his punishment. Allah will continue to send good to you. He will not only make life easy for you, he will not only give you the ability to overcome your trials, but he'll keep blessings coming your way too. Subhanallah. But that's only for those of us who have taqwa Allah. Okay. Also, being conscious of Allah and fearful of his punishment. This is the number one thing that I preach about all the time. It gives you the ability to distinguish the truth from falsehood. It gives you the ability to recognize what truthfulness is and what falsehood is. Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, oh, you who believe, if you have consciousness and fear of your Lord, he will give you El Furqan, which is the criterion to judge between right and wrong. Too many Muslims today are caught up in the numbers. They don't know right from wrong. A person can come to you and tell you, like one sister gave us an example, that you can't wear a push-up bra. What does a push-up bra have to do with anything? Who said that a woman cannot wear a push-up bra? That's just ignorance. You'll be able to look at this person. Oh, it's Dr. Law, sister. You know, you can't wear a push-up bra because it's pushing your breast up, making them big. It's changing the creation of a law. What? <clears throat> You'll be able to look at such an idiot and laugh and move on. That's El Furqan because I'm telling you, Muslims today are ignorant. They'll tell you all kinds of things. You can't wear a push-up bra. You can't wear lipstick. You can't wear colors. You can't be beautiful. You can't buy a nice car. You can't have furniture. They'll tell you all kinds of stuff, you know. But if you are conscious of a law and fearful of only him, he'll allow you to be able to do just like Layla Nasheba. I laugh. When I hear stuff like that, I just think it's the most hilarious thing. I can't wear a push-up bra because it makes my breasts bigger than what they are. Lord, have mercy. Are you ignorant? Yes, you are. So again, El Furqan, this is something that Muslims are lacking today because we don't have taqwa Allah. 
also. Another benefit of having consciousness and fear of a law is, as we discussed earlier, a law will provide a way from out of any difficulty. A law says in the interpretation of meaning, whoever fears the law and keeps his duty to him, a law will make a way for him to get out of every hardship. And a law will provide him from sources he never imagined. People help will come from sources you never imagined. All because you believe in Allah, you're conscious of him, and you fear having his punishment. Also, for those of us who are conscious of Allah and fearful of his punishment, Allah will give you, will make you a guardian. And this is something, a guardian over Allah's religion. There are so many famous personalities and unfamous personalities. Right now, speaking about Ramadan, speaking about Islam, speaking about Allah, but most of them are not telling you right. Allah only gives guardianship of this deen to a select few. That's why I tell you guys, no one can make you a scholar. Just because you went to some school and paid some money and they gave you a piece of paper saying that you got a PhD in Islam, that doesn't make you a person of knowledge. That doesn't make you a scholar. Only Allah can give anyone El Khan. And Allah also says he is the one that gives guardianship of, of, the, of, of the religion to only to certain people. Most of these people with degrees in Islam are just plain ignorant. You listen to them, they're just plain ignorant or they have their own agenda. Either they're ignorant or they have their own agenda based on fame, based on whatever their agenda is, but it's not the agenda that Allah would want for them to have. You know, guardianship of this religion is only given by a law and he gives it only to a few. Listen to what a law says in the interpretation of the meaning. Indeed, the wrongdoers, they are friends and protectors of one another. But a law is the friend and protector of only the righteous and God fearing. So the true guardians of this religion are none other than those Muslims who are conscious of Allah and who fear his punishment. Not those Muslims who become, you know, lazy and laxed because of their followers, because they got millions of followers who have put them on pedestals and made them believe to themselves that they're scholars. You know, those are not the guardians of the deen. Only the truly righteous and God-fearing are guardians of this religion, okay? Also, another benefit of having consciousness and fear of Allah is Allah will cause you to not be frightened by others. You are aware that he jabbed, not caring what anyone else thinks. As Allah says <clears throat> in the interpretation, the meaning, if you are patient and have consciousness and fear of Allah, the plots of the unbelievers will not harm you at all. Indeed, Allah knows what they do. And I tell you guys all the time, I know I'm a witness to this because the unbelievers I worked with, with plot and plan, they made it a regular practice to plot and plan, plot and plan how they could try to turn the clients, you know, to attack me. And it never happened. It never, ever, ever happened in 35 years, never. I've never had a client attack me, ever, ever, ever. Allah fouled all their plots and plans. I continued to wear my hijab. I continued to dress in my abayas. I continued to be the beautiful Muslim woman. I am not caring what the Kafirs thought. So because my consciousness of Allah is, was great and my fear of him, I fear him, not anyone else. So again, for those of us who have consciousness of Allah and fear of him, 
You don't care about other people and what they say or do because you know that Allah has your back and he will foul whatever plots and plans they have against you as long as you are remaining in, uh, uh, in true consciousness of him. And this is why Allah sends um, uh, uh, help from the heavens at times of hardship. Listen to what Allah says uh, in the interpretation of meaning. Already had Allah given you victory at the Battle of Badr when you were a little army, then have consciousness and fear of Allah so that you may be grateful. Remember when you, Muhammad, told the believers, is it not sufficient for you that your Lord should support you with 3,000 angels sent down? Yes, if you remain patient and have consciousness and fear of Allah, and when the enemy comes rushing at you in rage, your Lord will reinforce you with 5,000 angels. And that's what Allah did for the Muslims. When the prophet told the companions their first battle was the Battle of Badr, they were outnumbered three to one. They didn't have enough armory, enough weapons to fight against the Quraysh. But the prophet told them to trust in Allah you know, be faithful and trustful to Allah and Allah will send help in the form of the angels. And Allah did. And the Muslims were victorious at the Battle of Badr. Subhana Allah. So again, even if we are outnumbered, even if the odds are against us, if we are people of consciousness of a, and fear of Allah, Allah will send help from the skies to us. Also, being conscious of Allah and fearful of his punishment, it will cause you Wait a minute, let me move this out the way. It will cause you to lack enmity. It will cause you to lack, to not be jealous and envious of others. It'll cause you to know how to walk away, how to turn away from the ignorant people. Right here in the um, uh, Zoom room before I started class, uh, one of our students, Sister Gracie, was speaking about you know how one of her neighbors was trying to provoke her but she turned away she walked away from her you know she turned away from her didn't give in to it and then how another person wanted to try to cause enmity between her and another muslim but she knew to walk away from that too remember allah tells us in the interpretation of meaning help one another in Elbir and Ataqwa. In other words, help one another in virtue and righteousness, but do not help one another to commit sin and transgression. What does this mean? Bir. This is the excellent, the virtue and goodness that's present in something. Also, a good man is described as being a person of bar, a person who fulfills his promise. So bitter comprises all kinds of goodness. So we should help one another to be the best we can be as, as Muslims in our dealings with others. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, bitter is, it refers to good manners and ithm refers to the evil thoughts that come in your mind. So we have to help one another to, to be good in our actions and mannerisms and help one another to not give in to the evil thoughts and the evil uh, sinful people and circumstances around us, okay? And also having consciousness and fear of Allah, it will cause you to respect the sacred places of Allah. And this is a big problem today. Like I told you, because of COVID, we can't go to the mosque like we used to. And it might be good in a way. Because I know as a woman, for we women, we women would go to the mosque and we couldn't enjoy the kutbah. We couldn't enjoy the breaking of the fast because of the children, the bad children running through the mosque, screaming and hollering, fighting and wrestling all over the floor. You know, you can't hear the kutbah. You can't benefit for anything. You know, teach your children to respect the, the, the houses of Allah, even here in my Zoom room. Every time a person does a lecture, what happens? Somebody's bad child gets on that screen, on that whiteboard. Just yesterday when, when Esau was giving his class, 
some bad child was writing on the whiteboard. And I tell you guys all the time, teach your children to respect the sacred places of Allah. The mosque is a sacred place. This Zoom room is a place of learning. Teach your children, don't come here writing on a whiteboard. You come here and sit and listen. When Layla Nasheba ask a question, then you can get on the mic and answer, but do not come in here, you know, getting on a microphone, uh, uh, playing and screaming and hollering and writing on the whiteboard. You know, teach your children to respect the sacred places of worship, guys. And this Zoom is a, a, an environment of worship because we come here to learn Islam. Learning Islam is an act of worship. So teach your children how to behave here. They can do whiteboard when they're on Zoom for their school. But when you come in here, no whiteboard, no drawing, no playing on the mic or any of that. Okay. But why is it that some of us as parents, as parents have a hard time teaching our children that? Because we're people who lack taqwa ourselves. You have to become more conscious of Allah and fearful of his punishment. And in turn, you can then share that uh, with your children, okay? So thus guys, those are just some of the many benefits to having consciousness and fear of a lost punishment. Again, as we are coming almost, you know, towards an end of this second week of fasting, I want us to work on this even more. I want you guys to, uh, after you break your fast tonight, when you and your children eat dinner, sit down with the family, with the children and your husband and ask everyone, what do we think about ourselves? Do you think we are more conscious of a law? Do you even understand what being conscious of Allah entails? Are we more fearful of Allah or do we fear what others think or what others say over him? And then discuss, review the benefits or the fruits of having consciousness of Allah with your family. And then together, try to work on what you guys can do as a team to try to develop more consciousness of Allah. Okay, so we'll stop right here for today. Uh, I want to remind everyone that we have another class that'll be happening in about 15 minutes. Uh, my cousin Mukhtar, uh, he'll be joining the Zoom room. He's going to give you guys a very heartwarming study, I mean, story of an eminent companion, uh, the story of Cobb ibn Malik. And this is a wonderful story because it teaches us how. Allah is more forgiving than he is wrathful. And being that this is the month of Ramadan, this is also the month of forgiveness. And we're gonna talk about how next week about how this is the month of forgiveness. But his story should, will serve as an inspiration to each and every one of us about how no matter how bad your sin is, Allah will forgive you as long as you turn to him out of sincerity, seeking his forgiveness. So we're going to stop right here for today. Uh, inshallah, uh, and, and uh, join the Zoom room uh, and for Brother uh, Mukhtar's uh, lecture in about 10 minutes. And I will broadcast it on Facebook. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashad.